Why not, right? Might be a minute early. Let's begin with prayer. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you continue to pour forth your blessings upon your people, the church. Flawed and broken as we are, misguided by self and the world as we sometimes can be. We pray that not only would your mercies be always uh, evident in our lives, but that we would be, by your spirit, drawn closer and more fully to you always. In all situations, that as we learn of you, our faith would deepen, uh, be even more joy-filled and effective in this world. For your sake, amen. amen. All right, so we'll start uh, by um, a personal admission. Uh, in in uh, our marriage, there have been very, very few difficult days. But this is the anniversary of one of them. September 29th, 1978, the anniversary of my worst sermon ever. So turn to some at your table, and in honor of my worst sermon ever, say to some at your table, what was that? What was that? Turn. What was that? <laughs> oh, it was awful. Oh. It was true, and it went nowhere. And right in the middle of it, I knew I was in bed. <laughs> oh. Anyway. And nobody, what? It's St. Michael's Day. Today, September 29th is St. Michael's and All Angels Day, so I tried to be clever. Didn't work. All right. Act 6. Let's turn to Act 6. Say it again. What's the Wi-Fi? What's the wi you need password? Uh, Cry. What is our Wi-Fi? It doesn't reach down here. Yeah. What? Are you making that up? No. C L welcome. C L welcome. C L welcome. All the first three letters are capitalized. Excuse me, and then an exclamation point at the end. C L welcome. And password is. All right, so chapter six, we've been dividing, uh, by the way, I don't see uh, Barbara Sprague here, but she asked me last week to be sure to talk about uh, if you could cast lots in the election like they did in Acts chapter one. I said, mm. that was my answer, mm. Acts six. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose some of them from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented those men, these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against the wis his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never 
stop speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And then we get to ch chapter 7. All right, so uh, I, I've got two pages of notes. We're going to go through that. Uh, I didn't... Um, I didn't spend a lot of time on things that I couldn't really get more deeply, get more information. There were some verses in here I said, I, sh I, I, I did my research, I said, well, that's probably all we have. So I'm not going to dwell too much on that. But let's see what we do have. All right? Things are going very well. Okay? The authorities have been, in my words, put on their heels after the great miracle of prison and preaching. Remember last chapter, uh, we were looking at that, and... Um, the apostles, we don't know how many, except it was plural, and it was at least three or more. Uh, they were imprisoned. They escaped from prison by the miracul miraculous uh, working of the angel of the Lord. They were brought into the, the temple courts, and uh, the, um, the uh, authorities were, were thinking about execution. And Gamaliel, a very wise um, leader, said, you know what? Leave it alone. If it's of God, you're just going to fight against yourself. Okay. That was his wisdom, and it's good wisdom. But we ought to think about that. Beca and the, then, of course, they flogged, and I didn't do any more research on that. I know you asked me to, and I forgot. It happens, right? But there was, it's the flogging, the 39 um, whippings. But you've got to figure out that the authorities who wanted to eradicate Christianity, they had nothing else to do except execute, when you think about it. They've tried everything else. And so we're now being introduced to Stephen, who will be executed by the end of chapter 7, the first Christian martyr. But you can understand the authorities from, their, from an evil uh, perspective. What else are we going to do? We tried everything. If imprisonments aren't going to work, and if flogging's not going to work, what did the people do? They went away rejoicing. We read that last week. They went away rejoicing that they were, uh, they were allowed to suffer in Jesus' name. They thought, beautiful, we're happy. If you're happy with the floggings, what else can we do? Execution. That's coming up. So you can ju just, of course, God's word is true. But even, even, from, a, um, even from the setting of Building a novel or building a story, you, you can see how this is developing. You can see what's going to be next. You can always say, I, th I think what's going to be next. I think I know. They're going to kill somebody, right? So if you had never read this before and you were going through this, I think that, have to, that would have to be in your mind because the authorities were put up by Gamaliel for just a short time. But you can tell they weren't, they weren't appeased in their anger at all or their fear and insecurity, whatever it was. It was going to lead to, to, um, to death, all right? All that they have left, I'm still in the first paragraph, is execution. Prisons don't hold these people. Great floggings only lead them to more exuberance in their lives and effectiveness in significant growth. Don't miss that. It's just so short. And the word of God grew. The word of God spread. There are more people. Uh, we're given those things consistently in these first six chapters of the book of Acts. There's a constant growth. Speaking of a growth, and their faith-led commitment to be generous with all who are in need, some of them have noticed a discrepancy in care. This is not good. So this would be a controversy. This would be a challenge of the early church. We're not happy with the way the widows in our grouping are, don't seem to be getting as much care or attention as these other widows. And we need to talk about that. So God bless them for talking about it, for one thing, rather than letting it simmer deep inside and growing into some kind of an explosion, they said, this is what we're noticing. I think we better handle this, okay? Based on different verses that we've read so far, many scholarly estimates of the total number of believers would be around 25,000. Could be higher, but I think if you say 25,000 by this time, uh, you wouldn't be far off. Just as, just as you build the verses from chapter 1 all the way on. We're given the numbers. 
3,000 and 5,000 early on in chapters 1 and 2. And then they stopped counting, except that they would give the phrase, or Luke would give the phrase, and the numbers of believers increased, or, and the word of God spread. Those are the ways that were given that information. Okay? It isn't difficult at all to understand that there would be problems associated with such growth. All right, now, cultural and language differences seem to have created the problem, or at least the sense that there was a problem. And I'm not saying there wasn't. I'm only saying that they sense that there's a problem here. Note that all of these people were still Jewish people. Well, perhaps with a few proselytes, we got one of the deacons, Nicholas, who had become fully Jewish before the new faith in Christ. All right, now, so that we understand this, well, let's go back to Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, if we would. Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Now there was staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. They would have been in Jerusalem as part of the Passover uh, festivities and then lengthier stays. Some would be there for a short time, some longer. But this is who they are on the day of Pentecost. God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Throughout history, there have been different, different dispersions of the Jewish people because of this difficulty or that ruler or this famine or whatever it was, and so they scattered. And just like you have Jewish people all over the world today, it would have been that way then with limitations of where the nations were, of course. I'm not implying that they were in North America at all. But in, the, in that day, in that world, they were all over. Okay? They were coming back, at least some, every year they'd come back to Jerusalem. That's what we have here. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. So they hadn't been gone for five or seven years. They may have been gone for five or seven or ten generations. And so living in those other places of the world, they would become very accultured or acclimated to the local language. We see that all the time in history. Okay? You see it in our own generation, right? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing some of you have grandparents or great-grandparents. They didn't speak much English, if any at all, because they weren't born here. They came here. Next generation, a whole lot better. They probably were adept at two different languages. Have you ever heard... A German-American say, I can't speak a word of German, right? Maybe, maybe some of you are guilty of that, right? Or talk about a Spanish person here for three, year, for three years, three generations from uh, Mexico. They say, yeah, I don't speak it very well. I know a few words. That's it. I am American. So, but by birth, by, by blood, it would be Mexican. And so we understand how that is. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans, in other words, the disciples, then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. That's a big list. And they were all of bloodline Jewish people but from different cultures. So when we get into chapter 6 and we discover that we got a controversy here because there is a, a discrepancy, seemingly, between the way the food for widows uh, in need was being distributed. But just look at that list back in Acts chapter 2. Maybe they were even a little bit upset within each other. Yeah, you Parthians, you're getting more than we Romans. Uh, we need to talk about that. They address this problem head on. This is the way God's people, you know, I don't want to make too much of this in a preachy way, but I would say this is the way <clears throat> the people of God are called to meet problems to say, bring it up, head on. All right, now, before we go farther, let's go to chapter 10, verses 30 and 36. Because up until chapter 10, the Christian faith is almost exclusively Jewish people. Verse 30 through 36. And we'll look at this in a few months when we get there. Or weeks. 
Cornelius answered. Now I want to go 34. Let's just go to 34. Now let's stop. Let's start at 30. I had a, it was a good idea. Cornelius answered. Four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes, Reed Angel, stood before me and said, Cornelius. God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. So the Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing. All, he healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And then he went on, and it's the outflowing of the Holy Spirit in a completely Gentile setting. And it just about shook Peter to the core. I mean, we're asking a man to do what just wasn't unfamiliar, but what up until that day he considered to have been wrong. We'll, we'll look at that more carefully. We'll look at this whole thing but I, I want to just connect this with Acts chapter 6. The, the distribution of food was Grecian Jews and Hebraic Jews. These families who had ultimately stayed in Jerusalem um, after coming to faith in Christ, part of the joy of being a congregation as large as it had become. Okay? In fact, I believe it was seven congregations, but that's for about 15 minutes from now. All right. Back to the problem. The apostles, note, all of them, not just Peter, so no hint of Pope here, in case any of you wondered about that, although I don't think that's an issue. The apostles acknowledged it, blamed no one, and set forward wisdom for a solution. Recognizing their own limitations, not only in terms of purpose, but seemingly also of gift mix. Now, I don't want to go too far out on the limb, because even if two or three of the apostles had been gifted in these kinds of administrative concerns, it wasn't what Christ had called them to do or to be. But I'm guessing that some of them just wouldn't have been gifted to handle this, as well as some others would have been gifted by God. And we're going to have hints of that later um, as, we, as we look at some of the giftedness of God's people. Uh, they're not all apostles, right? Some are teachers, some are administrators, and we're going to get the glimpse of that right here, okay? But their wisdom, the apostles' wisdom, set forth clear expectations. So the apostles didn't say, you're right, figure this out, or you're right, can't do a thing about it. But they gave the parameters of what the answer would be, okay? We're not just going to have any of you, even though you're all loved by Christ, we're not just going to have any of you take upon yourself this task, but you need to be, what is it? Let's go back to chapter 4, chapter 3 rather. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. Okay? Not only are they full of the Spirit and wisdom, but that they are known to be that way. So that no one can say, hey, what about, why him? You know, they're known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. That's all the apostles said. They didn't make the selections. They seemingly backed away, having set forth the wisdom of Christ. I believe, going back to 40 days between Easter and Ascension, Jesus had a lot to teach these guys. And I'm not so sure that this is not one thing that he taught them. Uh, you know, this is going to happen now. And you need to be ready for this. And this is how you're going to handle it. I'm not saying that happened. I'm saying I wouldn't be surprised if that's one of the topics 
that Jesus addressed between Easter and Ascension. That's me. I can't prove that. But I could be right on that one. Right. right? Isn't that right? Sometimes you say, this is my opinion. And I don't know if I'm right or wrong. We have that. And you say, this is my opinion. I'm pretty sure I'm right. Or this is my opinion. I'm sticking to it until you can prove me I'm wrong. So there are, you know, yeah, okay, different levels. All right. But the wisdom set forth clear expectations. The believers were not called to select just anybody they wanted, but only those men who are qualified in two ways, faith-filled and the gifted, skilled for the task. All right. I don't know if I wrote this down here anywhere. Did I? It's my opinion, and I don't know if I'm right on this one that the number seven indicated that already they had found themselves dividing into seven different congregations. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking that, for instance, Stephen. All right, I'm going to take care of these people with whom I've been worshiping regularly anyway. It'll be a natural fit. That's how I understand it. I don't think they were thrust upon, all right, you go over there, you've never met those people. You know, 25,000, how many, how many 25,000 people do you know, right? So I don't know those people very well. I just wonder if this indicates that there were seven congregations. I know seven's a holy number, but there's no indication that that's why it was. Dwayne. Well, I'll just go back to what I just said. I, I, you mean, why was it men? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think we've got, when we talk about men and women, we're talking about equality under God and salvation. There's no doubt about that. We're also talking about there are God-given roles that God has given to men and women. And uh, I believe that God would desire that the men of God are to lead. Not, not in arrogance or haughtiness, same thing. Uh, not in presumption that they're better than anybody else. But this goes back to the order of creation. And I believe that it fits itself in there. Now, there are deaconesses that we'll read about later. Women who served. Uh, but the word here is, by the way, the word serve is diakonos. So we have the word deacon from that. In the actual Greek, and I forgot to be my Greek today, is diakone uh, trapezoid. So the word for all of you who studied, um, um, not algebra, what's next? Geometry. Geometry. I knew there was a word. Uh, it, it, trapezoid. It, trapezoid comes from the word for table in the Greek. So uh, diakonos is deacon. Later on, we'll find women involved who might be called deaconesses. There are also wives of deacons. We're going to get that sometime in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 3. Does, does this passage fit into our LCMS position on um, the pastorate? Well, I believe the pastors are to be men of God. I would say yes, of course. So if you were, if you were to break this apart uh, for what we have here, here, meaning congregations other than ours as well, you have pastor. Then you have, we call them elders. The role of elder would be very close to this deacon, assisting the pastors so that they can be involved in what? Ministry of the word and prayer. Now, that includes visitation. It includes other things. But essentially, we're saying, pastors, I don't have time for that. Frankly, I don't have a skill set for that. I need to have men of God around me supporting and blessing. I don't think we've ever done that perfectly well, but it's the picture we have here. By the way, this will be on your test. There are three different Greek words for pastor in the New Testament. Shepherd, 
elder and bishop. That's important to know. Those are three different words identified in the same office. Shepherd, care, right? Elder, wisdom, one, who, one, who has, one who's been trained. I mean, we went to seminary for this stuff. And then bishop, one who was called to be the leader. Yeah. You, you'll do really well on my test. That's what a good teacher does. I'm giving you all the answers. Thank you for so supporting me on that one. Dwayne, anything else on that? So you got deacon, uh, you got deacon, and you got seven of them, and they all have Greek names. Interesting. But that doesn't mean they were all from the um, Greek culture, even though they're all Jews, because even some of the disciples had Greek names. Andrew, Philip are Greek names. So we're not going to say too much about that. But these are the men who were brought forward, and they presented the men to the apostles, presumably for approval, who prayed and laid their hands upon them. Laid their hands upon them is not so much transferring uh, a specific authority. Okay, now you're gifted, but to say you are now with me and, and under our direction. Okay, does that make sense? So this is how they solved that. And we don't hear about this again. To care for the, the, the poor among them. Now, um, all right, the word used here is diakonos, pardon me, deacon. The literal meaning, at least in this text, is to serve or literally to serve tables. Clearly, this is a reference to the distribution of food. We're going to go to chapter 2. Let's go back there. Acts chapter 2. And 42, verse 47, are, it's the quintessential description of the early Christian church and what we are to be. Okay? What is true about any Christian congregation when they are aligned with the word of God? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We've talked about this. Why? Because Jesus taught them. To the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, is, is, is that where communion is, or is communion in, introduced in the apostles' teaching? I'm not going to discuss that right now. 43. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Now we're talking about 3,000, or maybe 5,000 with women and children. Selling the possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, um, in verse 45, we have um, anyone who had need were taken care of. That, that's the point. These words here... And, and see, if, see if my wording makes sense to you. These words are descriptive rather than prescriptive. Does that make sense? So descriptive means this is how the early believers are doing it. There's no reason for us not to pursue those truisms or those manners without knowing that it has to be exactly that way. Does that make sense? So we don't meet together daily, for instance. But we don't neglect the apostles' teaching. We don't neglect meeting together. We don't neglect eating together. Now, we don't do that every day, but we understand that meals among believers become a significant part of who we are. Right? Um, I have had great joy in, in my years, and I've not caught everybody yet. And, and by God's grace, the leaders around me have always said, we'll support it in the budget. But going out with men one-on-one -on -one for breakfast or lunch or just coffee or sometimes, and I know you don't think this is ministry, so bear with me. But every once in a while, I'll try and meet a young man and say, you know, I, 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 I leave for work at 
I don't get home till about 1.30, I can't have breakfast or lunch. I said, how about pie and ice cream? <laughs> That's ministry. Is it not ministry? Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but, I, but I believe there's something almost holy to that. Um, and so I, I, anyway, okay. Because it's the anniversary of my worst sermon ever, I'm a little bit mindful that I don't want to do the same thing. Yes. Oh, Charlene's hand is up. Was it up high? Yes. We are so hurt. We are so hurt when yeah. we're neglected or ignored. Or, or when the world hates us. Yeah, well, yeah, but I'm thinking in the church, how we take offense yeah. at, at small things so often. And yet, by God's grace, we can rejoice at the beginning. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you. She's a wise lady. All right. Uh, clearly, this is a reference to the distribution of food. See chapter 245. We just did that. To, a fellow, to assist fellow believers with issues of hunger is a good thing. But it cannot be allowed to get in the way of preaching and prayer. Ideally, both are very much part of kingdom work. So let's find a way to see that both are done. I think, I think that would be a summary statement of what's happening in chapter 6. It, does, does feeding the, the widows, does that come as high as extending the word to non-believers? No. But that doesn't make it unimportant. It's very important. And it's very much, very much matches the heart of Christ. And at the very core, that's what we want to do. Um, you know, there's a verse in the Galatians. If you want to mark down Galatians 6, 9, and 10, we're not going to turn there. Um, so as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. And I, th I think you can see that verse in a lot of the book of Acts. As the opportunity arises, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's Galatians 6, 9, and 10. All right. Seven men were chosen, quite possibly, there he goes, indicating seven congregations within the full body of believers. But we do know that the extraction of that number was given by the apostles. So now I just, I lost chapter 6. So if you look closely at chapter 6, where we've been, 3, in verse 3, the apostles said choose seven men. The apostles didn't say pick however many you think you want. The, the apostles said choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the wisdom, uh, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. It will give this uh, responsibility over to them. Okay. So that was set aside for the people. Okay. Of the seven deacons, we learn about two of them, and only two more fully. Otherwise, nothing more is written. So five, as crucial as they were to the time. And I'm going to say that they were crucial to these early days of the Christian church. We don't know anything more about them. But we do know a little bit more about Stephen and Philip. All right. Now, I want to show you a little, 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 little word. In verse 7, it's the word so. It could be, Luke says, I'm continuing the story. Or it could be his little use of the word so as meaning therefore. Okay. Therefore, the word of God spread. They had been growing. And then they face this problem. And you and I know problems in a church can derail an entire ministry. We know that. We probably all have stories of that. But when a problem is met head on with the grace of Christ and the love uh, of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, they solve, resolve the problem, and now there's growth again. So I think... Here again, my opinion, and on this one I think I'm right. So, doesn't mean, okay, I'm going back to the big story. 
Therefore, the word of God spread. That's how I read it anyway. And, and I, I think that's one of those examples of a real small word having a powerful presence in the whole story of, of Christ's church. Okay. So, all right. So I think it's cause and effect. Back page. Stephen, the first martyr, is featured, that's my word, in the next chapter. We possibly read of this particular Philip twice more. And when I say that, we're going to look at the verses right now. When I say that, there's no where this is, oh, and Philip, who had been one of the first deacons, now is doing this work. But I couldn't find any scholarly viewpoint, and I didn't spend a month on this. I spent a week on this. They would say he's not the man we're going to look at now in Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 20, 21. Uh, so let's go to Acts chapter 8, please. Acts chapter 8. And I'm going to skip around a little bit, but we will start at 5. No, we'll start at 2. No, we'll start at 1. <laughs> Thought this one through, didn't I? All right. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. We'll hear about Saul in chapter 9. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip. Now, everybody was scattered except who? The apostles. And Philip was not an apostle. If, if, this doesn't refer to the disciple because he would have stayed by definition of that verse. So most, most scholars think this is the deacon who in his being scattered now, the task would be different. And he became an evangelist, which doesn't deny his earlier work as a deacon. It just means the situation had changed. He is thrown out into a whole different world, and he's become an evangelist. Okay. Then I want to take you to verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official, in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Think cabinet, all right? This guy's in the cabinet. How did the, how did the church get to Ethiopia? Not by the, forgive me, not by the little old man on the street begging, although that's certainly been done other times by God, but we're going to one of the leaders. The angel of the Lord said, you go meet that chariot. Okay. And we're not going to get a lot of this. The man had gone, uh, this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home, was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told him, go to that chariot, stay near it. We'll, we'll study this later. But the point of the deacons is that Stephen is not long for this life. And after Stephen's death, whether that was a month or six months after the appointing of them as deacons, then there was a scattering. And so when we're scattered, we're going to be doing ministry differently. But we're still going to do ministry. We're going to do ministry. And that's what Philip was doing. All right, we're also going to get to chapter 21. Acts chapter 21, if you would, please. 8 and 9. Leaving the next day, we, now that means Luke is now in the text. Sometimes it's they, sometimes it's we. Um, leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. Okay, see that? That makes it very clear. One of, what, what do you mean one of the seven? Remember Acts 6? Now, by the time you get to chapter 21, you may have forgotten a little bit about Acts chapter 6. That's the recollection. This is Philip, 
who now is identified as who? An evangelist. Okay. So uh, of, the, of, the seven, of the seven deacons, uh, five we know nothing else about. Except one of them was not Jewish by blood, but had become a proselyte or attracted to the Jewish teaching of one God and all of the truth that Moses taught. And then after he had spent time on that, then he found Christ. So that's what that was. Okay? Questions or comments about any of this? All right. Second page. Now we read of Stephen's ministry, beginning with a second specific description, a man full of grace and power, which agrees with verse 5. A man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Possibly then he was viewed by all as chief deacon. And that's my word. Uh, that's just... That's just my suggestion, that among the seven, they may have organized this, all right, you be the head, and we'll report back to you. I don't know that, but for some reason, uh, Stephen rose in his presence to have done some miracles and also been the one willing to speak up against the authorities. Maybe the others weren't doing that because they didn't think that was their gift and they'd leave it to the apostles, but Stephen was right in there and that led to his death. Okay. Uh, certainly the authorities quickly learned of him. An intriguing word has told us about Stephen and the working of miracles. Possibly it was among those he was called to serve. You know, to whom did he do these miracles? Is it possible that he, when he came upon the widows and said, all right, let's make sure we're doing this right. He found that some needed healing. And through Stephen, there were healings, there were miracles. We're just not given much. Uh, except we know that, you know, when, when Jesus sent out the 72, and then other, other times he sent out the 12 to the short-term mission trip, one of the things that they were to do is not, not only to preach the word of God, but to heal and to cast out demons. So it could be that uh, Stephen is the only one of the seven, I'm not saying he was, but I'm thinking it could be the only one of the seven who had that momentary gift uh, from God. And that's all I can say about that. Okay. I do want to, and I didn't write this down because it's, it's such a powerful statement. A large number of priests became obedient to the faith. If there's anything that could have unsettled the authorities more than just the sheer growth of numbers is that some of their own were, were going over to Christ and following Jesus' name. That must have been very unsettling. But even a number of the priests became obedient to the faith. And obedience or obey is used elsewhere as a description that I am fully, I am fully following my Jesus. That, that's obedient uh, in the faith. Okay. All right, uh, let me just read this. An intriguing word told by Stephen. Um, we're not told, nor do we read of any other deacons doing signs and miracles, yet this is certainly one more thing that seems to have Stephen apart, if even a little bit, from the other deacons. And here comes the opposition to argue with him. The arguing failed, and what did that lead to? Threats and plotting. Okay? You would hope that when their arguing failed, they would just say, whatever. Okay? No, no. Their hatred toward God was so intense that they said, if arguing is not going to convince you how terrible you are, Stephen, then we're going to plot against you so that we can kill you. Okay. Now, we're going to look at these verses. Let's go back to the Old Testament, 1 Kings 21. 1 Kings, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. So, Toward the beginning, but not overly close. <clears throat> All right, First Kings twenty one. Verse four. Ahab's the king and he wanted the garden of Naboth, and Naboth said, No, I can't sell it to you, it's the garden of my parents, my grandparents and my family. So Ahab went home, sullen and angry, read, pouting, okay? All right, pouting. Because Naboth, a Jezreelite, had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. He lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. This is the king. 
sulking in his bed, refusing to eat. This, this boy didn't grow up. Uh, five, his wife Jezebel still identified with wicked women. His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? He answered her, because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I, I will give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said, is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat. Cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, placed his seal on them, and sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters she wrote, proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people, but seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them testify that he has cursed both God and the king, then take him out and stone him to death. Okay, Jezebel and Ahab. Okay, let's get two scoundrels to lie. Okay, so it's not new in Stephen's day. It's not new in Jesus' day. But let's turn to Mark 14. You can find it in Matthew 26, but Mark gives us one extra verse that I like. Mark 14. Verse 53. Mark 14, verse 53. They took Jesus of the high priest, and all the chief priests, elders, and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards. He warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus, <clears throat> pardon me, so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple, and in three days will build another not made by man. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. And only Mark has that verse, interestingly. I find that fascinating. Okay? But we have two other examples before Stephen's life and the scoundrels. Uh, being, being called to testify falsely against Stephen, we already know that that's the way the world works. We saw it in, in, in the terms of the evil reign of Ahab and Jezebel. We saw it in the uh, trial of Jesus. Okay. The same kind of issues were mentioned, the temple and Moses. And <laughs> it, interestingly, those are never crucial parts of the Christian faith. But to be fair, Jesus came to free us from the hold of the laws of Moses. We're thinking that we, should, we could worship God only in one place. We're free of that. Okay. We'll see in the next chapter that Stephen bril brilliantly answered both of those charges. In themselves, the charges were ludicrous, of course, but fueled hatred against the name of Jesus, along with a desire to harm Stephen. Brought before the Sanhedrin, the sham trial was about to begin. But first we are told of this amazing appearance of Stephen. His face was like that of an angel. And it isn't that this was just from a quick glance. You know, sometimes, sometimes you take a quick glance at something and say, did I, is that, did I see? No. And then you look and tell, no, I guess it was something different. This is not that. Because it says, they looked intently at him meaning stared, right? So it's not like, oh, we looked, oh, he, oh, the sun was just hitting my eyes, and wow, it looked like he might have been an angel. They were looking intently upon him, and his face was like that of an angel. I don't know what that looks like, but it set Stephen aside before he began one of the most brilliant defenses of the faith. And... I'll just give you a hint. If you want to read chapter 7 on your own before we get together again. <clears throat> but Stephen was laying out the ways of God in the history of his people, Israel. And everything was perfect. And then Stephen turned on them and said, you're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. You are stiff-necked people. That is okay, we'll kill you for that. But up until then, there's nothing that he said, nothing that he said, 
that they could have countered as false teaching. It's a br chapter 7 is brilliant in, not defense, but description of the ways of God. All right, let's turn to Luke, 2, uh, Luke 12, 11. Luke 12, 11. Just to kind of get a look at what it might be for the face of an angel. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. <clears throat> Whether or not the Holy Spirit teaching Stephen what to say had anything to do with his appearance, I, I don't want to say for sure, but I think there might be a connection there. All right? And it's very possible, and I believe this, that the description was given by Paul himself to the writer Luke, who were later very, very good friends. I want you to see chapter 8, verse 1. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. <clears throat> and Saul was there giving approval to his death. So the fact that Saul was an eyewitness and had a close connection with Luke, the author, uh, it may very well be that that description, that all who looked on him, uh, on Stephen intently, noticed that his face was like the face of an angel. So I do believe that that was Paul's description. I, I believe that. Okay. One more thing, and I'm going to get preachy at you right now. <clears throat> if I could. Would you be mindful of carefully but firmly, lovingly and maybe generously identifying young men to be our pastors into the future? We're not all called to do that. We're not. But there are some. And for them to be sought out lovingly from within their own congregation or family settings is not a small thing. Not in, you'd better, but have you thought about this? I think you might want to pray about this. And how can I help you? Do any of you want to hear my story of being a pastor? Have you heard it four times already? Who's heard it already? Okay, you may leave. <laughs> yeah, 10. All right, growing up, um, Lutheran schools, worship every Sunday. It would not be unusual for someone to say to me every three or four years, you know, you should be a pastor. And I hated it. I, I hated that. And it was never about me and God it was, eh, I don't think so. And I don't want to break the Eighth Commandment, but I wonder if as a kid, I sensed that our own local pastor was unhappy and overworked. I've thought about that. Maybe that's why I said no. So then Lutheran High School and Old Testament class, I had one of the most fantastic teachers of Old Testament he has made the scripture so much alive for me. I love that class. And he happened to be my baseball coach also. So there was that connection. And I'm, um, no, no. And then I began dating Jane, February 1970. And by June, I knew I would marry her and be a pastor. It was unshaking in my, in my heart, my mind. It's what I, okay, that's my life. My life is now cast for me. And even September 29, 1978, I, as bad as that sermon was, I hung in there, right? But that's how it worked for me. So I try to identify, I, I don't try and talk to anybody before freshman or sophomore year of high school. But there's some young men we got to start talking to. So you don't have to do this, 
But have you thought about this? I'd like you to pray about this. And how can I help you? How can I assist you? So it's a word for me to you. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, who's going to take care of our grandchildren spiritually? You think about that, don't you? Okay. I'm looking at pastor's kids over there. I got who I got several pastor's kids who are in here. All right. Anything else? We're almost done. Jane, uh-oh. <laughs> Jane. No, when, when they looked at, at Stephen and Timothy, they were looking at the Bible and 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 they were looking Psalm 34, let's turn there. Psalm 34. Verse 5. Those who look to him sparkle. Is that what you said? Yeah. Those who look to him are radiant. <clears throat> Their faces are never covered with shame. Do you sparkle? I put glittering. You put down glittering? Well, you know, glitter. Glitter sparkles. Yeah, I know about you and glitter. I've been hit by you and glitter. Okay. Anything else? Good. Thanks. By the way, uh, remember that when I'm teaching, I'm kind of engrossed here. So if you want to say something, that's not going to do it. Right? My hands up. No. Brian, would you accept that in your classroom? Hey, hand ho. Raise the hand high, right? All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, you are Lord of the church and Lord of our lives, and we thank you for Stephen and Philip and the other deacons. The role they filled to bless your people in need and to be a part of your kingdom expanding. We pray that in our day, even with all the forces of evil and darkness, yet would your kingdom flourish and thrive and grow and sparkle in your name, for your sake, to your glory, we pray. Amen. Okay, bye everybody. See you.